Welcome everyone to the American Civil War Museum's Homefront Education Series as we walk through the war with you. I'm Joseph Rogers and I'm joined by Stephanie Arduini, the Deputy Director of the American Civil War Museum. And Stephanie, we are here in the uh, People's Contest, our main gallery, uh, main exhibit here down in Richmond, Virginia, and we are walking through the war. So as we've left 1862, the Emancipation Proclamation is just about to take effect, and so now we've entered 1863. And so what's happening? I think one thing that's important to remember is that we're two years into the war, and this was something that people initially thought was going to be over and done quickly, and it's gone on for two years, and there's not a clear sense of who's winning, which way the momentum is going, so I think that's important headspace to be in as we imagine and think about stories of 1863. Absolutely. How would you feel if it just keeps going with no end in sight, no clear sense of who's winning or taking control of the situation, and it just keeps feeling like it gets crazier and keeps getting worse. Yeah, I mean, they're thinking in their minds, at what cost have we gotten into this? Mm -hmm. I mean, as we mentioned before, there are people thinking that all the blood that's going to be shed in the entire war would fit in a lady's thimble. So now, moving two years into it, and gallons upon gallons have been spilled, and it just keeps on going. What are people, even at home, now reacting to the battlefield? What are they thinking? Well, we're standing here by a case that talks about a really interesting story in Richmond that we'll use as kind of an example. So, for example, in the southern states, the United States Navy had blockaded around the southern states, making it hard for southern states to get their products out as well as get things in. And when you take into, the, into consideration that you have two armies traversing in and around Richmond in 1862, disrupting supply lines, right. using materials to feed their own soldiers, right. it makes it hard for citizens in Richmond to get food in and they're starving and they're desperate and hungry and in April 1863 women take to the streets in Richmond demanding food demanding support right. and that protest gets out of hand and turns into what's known as a bread riot this wasn't the only example of civilian protest that comes from a place of desperation but it's one that we have here imagining what that kind of desperation did even within the capital of the Confederacy. Absolutely. After all, if even just tying into where we are right now in Richmond, Virginia, but also at the Tredegar Ironworks site, mm -hmm. across the river from us, not even across the river, just across the way from us, was Browns Island, where two weeks before the bread riots happened, there was a large explosion where women and girls died in this large explosion and who had been working in these conditions are all coming into each other and they're piling up until eventually it does break out into one of the bread riots. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're taping this at a time where we were just talking about how I feel overwhelmed with all of these different news stories yes. going around. And this is only the beginning of a summer in 1863 where the news stories come fast and come furious mm -hmm. and they're really, really intense. Absolutely because it's not just confined to southern states and bread riots. We're talking about riots in other places as well. Uh, where else are we, are we really seeing these kind of civilian uprisings and unrests? So another notable protest that turns into a riot that we talk about in this exhibit is one that's called the Draft Riots. It happens in New York City. Mm -hmm. So in July 1863, mostly white working class immigrant people, mm -hmm. men mostly, in New York City take to the streets because they're upset about draft laws that they feel is unfair to them. Right. Because if you had enough money, you could buy your way out of being drafted. And so these immigrant men especially felt like they were bearing the undue burden of service in the Civil War for the United States. So they protest. That protest goes out of control because they also start targeting African Americans in the city of New York and lynching them. Right. This, they've started to conflate the idea of emancipation with the aim of the war because now it is a key aim of the war after Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Right. And what I think is fascinating is imagining units that were on the field in Gettysburg just a couple of weeks before are sent directly to New York City to restore order there. So you've got chaos in New York, 
chaos that's been down in Richmond. And we have other stories here that stretch across the country, out to Oklahoma, Virginia, South Carolina, Mississippi, all over the place. No matter if you're on the battlefront or if you think you're safe at home, these are stories that show that this war is impacting people no matter where they are. Absolutely. Wow. And so it's, it's incredible to kind of keep that in mind, especially as we continue on through 1863. Mm -hmm. uh, what's happening in the battlefields are affecting what's happening at home, and people coming home from the battlefields are now getting put into these situations where they're still having to do a lot of the kind of work that they're uh, doing to restore order. And so it's, it's really something to think about, uh, and definitely something that we're going to have to keep in mind as we move on to the latter half of 1863. Uh, so I do hope that you will join us for our next video where we explore the end of the year of 1863 and what is happening in the rest of that time. Thank you.